chills. Number one. This weekend, I got a chance to stay with my uncle for a bit. We never really talked much before then, but this weekend I learned so much. It started over dinner. We made small talk. I complimented him on the food and my aunt said he learned all he knew from the asylum. My ears perked up a bit. Were you like, in an insane asylum? I laughed. No, he laughed. I worked with the people in the kitchen. Cooking helped calm the people. But I also sometimes had to deal with all hands on deck situations. This really perked my interest. I've always been interested in insane people. I'm not sure why my mom never mentioned her uncle. He's our great uncle, worked at the asylum. Maybe she didn't know either. I immediately asked for a story. I told him I could handle the worst of the worst, but he didn't want to go to that. He told me this story and a few others, but I just want to tell you all one for now. Story 1 It was October 23rd, 1967. I remember the date because it was a week after your aunt gave birth to your cousin Leroy. I was working in the kitchen with some of the easier guys, the ones whose treatment was working. We lock up the knives and everything, obviously. I would get up each morning and pre-cut everything so we didn't have to get the knives out at all for anything. It took away a lot of flavor, but it was the safest thing to do for obvious reasons. That morning I got in and grabbed the knives out and began to do the prep work for the day. I was always alone in the kitchen. Nothing seemed out of place at all. I went along whistling and talking to myself. Then I went to pick up one of the paring knives and I couldn't find it. It was in the set a minute ago, but now it wasn't. I figured I had dropped it and began looking around for it. I could not find it. See, when things go missing, your mind instantly thinks of how you must have lost it. You forget what you're doing or where you are and get annoyed with finding it. I did this, but then something said in my head, go tell someone. That's when it hit me it may have been stolen. I had learned my first year that insane people have a way with going places they shouldn't be and magically disappearing. It's our job to make sure they don't disappear out of the asylum into public. But this? A knife. It could be deadly. I ran outside locking the door behind me in case whoever it was was still in there and ran out to tell someone. The whole place went on lockdown. Everyone and everything searched, but we couldn't find the paring knife. At this point, everyone, and I mean everyone, was accounted for. We all went into the kitchen and searched. No knife. They asked me if I knew for a fact it had gone missing. To prove it, I showed them a potato I had peeled that morning with it. We all agreed that was weird, but I'm sure you know that sometimes things can literally disappear into a void. I blamed myself and offered to pay for a new knife and apologized for the inconvenience, but we all agreed that safety of the staff was the most important. Still nervous, I asked for someone to help me in the kitchen, just in case there was an unaccounted for crazy lurking, I don't know, on the ceiling or something. I actually looked up to see if there was something or someone up there. One of the guys felt bad and hung out with me. Probably an hour into it, we were joking. I was feeling much better when we went into another lockdown. Over the intercom, we heard for everyone to stay where they were and keep the doors locked. That was different. Lockdowns usually meant you do that until the place is cleared. Why the clarification? Me and the guy I was with kept working away. When we were done, we were still in a lockdown. I phoned the front desk and a weird voice answered. Insane asylum, full of creeps and geeks. How can we screw you over today? I looked at the phone and hung it up. I basically thought at this point we were all in trouble. In 1967, we didn't have 911, so I phoned the local police and let them know that I thought the asylum was in a great deal of trouble. We waited in that kitchen for about four hours before a police officer showed up. He asked us to open the door. Me and my friend looked at him strange as if wondering if it was real. We both held knives behind our backs looking a bit crazy. Then we saw the head doctor with blood all over his coat and he said, let them in boys. We opened the door. So naturally we begged to know what the hell happened. One of the employees had stolen the knife when I was washing some lettuce in the sink. He waited for the all clear, then began opening the cells of the crazy people and trapped all the workers in the closet. One of the insane people stole the paring knife and killed him, then went around attacking other insane people. My call saved a lot of lives. Without it, and being in that room locked, 
I'm not sure how long those men would have been trapped and how many of the insane would have died by one stupid paring knife. It was a truly terrifying day. Number 2. First of all, I want to thank you all for your kind words in response to the last story I told. I'm excited that all of you are excited about this series and my uncle is impressed by the response and has said he will tell me more stories as he remembers them. He did mention that some of them were very traumatic and he would rather not talk about them, but he knows some old co-workers that might also be willing to share some. We've got lots of stories for this series. I'll try to post one a day if I can, but if I don't have any stories from him, I won't be able to. Patience is key. Let's get into it. Story 2 The Mumbler Back in 1973, political correctness was non-existent, so we had names for all of our patients. There was one we called the mumbler because he used to mumble around as he walked. He was harmless, but some of the things he would say were the most screwed up things you'd ever hear. The way he stood Vincent, it was downright creepy. He had his hands pulled in, like a picture of someone being paranoid wringing his hands constantly, and it was pulled up to his face as he mumbled. He'd walk the halls aimlessly and mumble. The nurses and doctors used to tell us if any of the crazy people made conversation to play along, act like we were right there with them in the struggle. When they heard voices, we heard them too. I used to play along sometimes, but I don't work with the true crazy people much, and when the mumbler joined the cooking classes, he was pretty well useless. He stood there and just mumbled. One day, I tried to see if he would join. I walked up to him and realized right away he soiled his diaper. He smelled absolutely awful. Now don't get me wrong, I cared for these people. That's why I was there. I called a nurse and out loud said he shit himself. Most of the time these crazies know they are crazy and don't care when you say stuff like that or are more than likely are totally oblivious altogether. This guy screamed so loud it was ear piercing. Shit, 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 I shit, I shit. This scared the others, he kept repeating it over and over. The nurses gave me a mean look and took him away screeching the halls how he shit himself. I knew this was one of those guys that was probably found painting the walls of his house with his own feces. I didn't think anything about him other than how weird he was. Crazy people are crazy and yes it was out of the ordinary, but not really when you consider the experiments these people went through. He never came back to class after that. Six months later, I was walking the halls and saw him again, without a nurse. I figured he had gotten out. I asked him where he was supposed to be. Even though you know for a fact a crazy person isn't dangerous, you still need to make sure you just don't walk up to them and grab them. I knew this after years of getting attacked by them. I kept my distance and he didn't respond, he just mumbled. I listened to him and I could make out this. Mama, I killed Mama. Daddy, I killed him too. Jerry, he hurt me first, he had to die. But Sissy, why did I kill Sissy? My heart skipped a beat. I realized he was counting on his hands. When he got to his sister, it was like he was actually wondering why he had killed her. I kept listening. Wife, you leaked red. Why did you do that? Baby, your head was full of worms and gum. I had to let them out. I had to eat them so you would be safe. I wasn't sure how to handle this situation, but I was pretty sure the mumbler was a guy who snapped, killed his whole family, and turned his brain into mush. I looked at him and said, Harold, buddy, let's go see the nurses. He looked at me with black beady eyes. His hands stopped moving because he stopped counting. My heart started racing. He looked at me and said, Why do I kill? When will the voices stop? Like I said before, the nurses always said play along. Harold, what are the voices saying? God, I knew this was a loaded question. Kill. They always want me to kill. Kill people. They told me we are all trapped, Bill. He grabbed his skin when he said trapped. This guy was being told we are trapped in our bodies, and when we die, we are released. I don't think he was trying to discuss philosophy with me. My heart started racing more. His hands went to his sides. He had no weapon, but he could still attack me. I had to think on my feet how to distract him and get the nurse's attention without escalating the situation. Harold, let's tell the voices together to shut up. I suggested. He nodded. Let's yell. Ready. One, two, three. 
Together we screamed shut up for about 10 seconds. The nurses came running, took him, and detained him. He immediately began struggling as they were so rough with him. He repeated shut up over and over. Then he just screamed over and over. They put him in a straitjacket and hauled him off into his room. I obviously needed to write a statement for the incident. I let the doctors know what I did and the head doctor praised me and said, I handled that very well. Never ever approach a crazy person with the idea they are going to be calm and collected just because they've been through therapy. The doctor closed his door behind me and asked me to sit down. Do you know why he is here? He asked. Of course I didn't and I told him. He was normal like you and I, but when he came back from Vietnam his mind never left the war. One day he just snapped. He started screaming and killed his entire family. He looked at me and paused. I knew there was more. They found him, Bill, eating the brains of his child, his baby Bill. I looked wide-eyed at him and said, what the hell? Remember how he talked about worms in the head of his baby? He turned around and looked at the window. War is tragic. He is one of those people we can't help. We can't kill him, so he sits in the hospital heavily sedated, counting the people he's killed. I'm not sure how he got out, but if he is ever unattended or given a weapon, I don't know what he will do. He grabbed a pen off his desk and toyed with it for a bit. Bill, sometimes I wonder if we'll end up like him. One day you're a normal guy, the next you're a psychopath walking the halls of an asylum, defecating yourself and counting all the people you've killed. Sometimes I wonder. He paused for a minute. If they are just better off dead. I looked at him strange. No doc, you and I are sane. I think there's more than just trauma at play. He's probably genetically unstable. You and I won't end up like that. And they are worth helping. I always felt like I needed to be the voice of reason. Asylums were for the better. If nothing else, it kept the crazies off the street. He leaned in on his table and looked at me square in the eye. Bill, the reason we keep people like him here isn't to help them. It's to study the brain and prevent others from becoming like that. He pointed off to the side. This hit home to me. He was right. Only a few of us there actually cared about the truly insane ones. Vincent, it still makes me sick to think that. That doctor thought that low of those people. A vet who went crazy, now shitting his pants every single day. And that doctor just saw him as a science experiment. What the hell? Number 3 For reference, my name's Eric and I had a best friend named Axel. Not anymore as you could probably guess from my wording. Axel and I were childhood friends, best friends. We lived on the same street and by the time we were five we were inseparable. At least according to our parents. From reading the title of this story, you guys are probably thinking something along the lines of how the fuck did Axel get into an insane asylum? Let me make it clear right now. Axel wasn't insane. Sure, he was a sarcastic son of a bitch, but he was a normal teenager. I've read some of the stories here on No Sleep which describe some people just not being right from the moment they're born. Axel wasn't like that. He was a perfectly normal and happy kid, straight through kindergarten to his senior year. It wasn't his fault, it was all mine. Two years ago, right after graduation, Alex and his parents were heading over to his grandparents in Los Angeles to celebrate him going to college. It was a six to seven hour drive, we live in Northern California, and they wanted to arrive early in the morning. They barely left the city when a drunk driver t-boned their car, a full tractor trailer ramming into a tiny Honda Civic. Both of Axel's parents died on impact. The doctor said it was a miracle that Axel even survived. At first we were hopeful. Somehow Axel had managed to avoid any major spinal injuries. With therapy, he would be able to walk again, move his entire body. It didn't look like his brain had been damaged so that he would be unable to function again. If he woke up, he would recover. The thing is, he never woke up. The first week was understandable. By the third week, we were begging the doctors for some sort of explanation. They could never find one. Theoretically, he should have woken up. There was nothing wrong. Needless to say, I didn't react very well to the accident. Axel's father and mother were basically a second set of parents to me. Axel himself was more like a brother to me than a neighbor. 
My real brother was already studying on the other side of the continent. For the very first time I could remember, I was alone. Of course, I still had my parents and other friends and everything, but Axel had always been there, a constant presence, sometimes a warm blanket and other times an annoying pest that wouldn't leave me alone. But regardless, he had always been there, and to see him disappear was a little more than I could take. Axel in my mind had always been a strong individual who wouldn't let anything stop him from getting his way. Seeing him unresponsive in some hospital bed didn't seem real. That said, you could probably guess I wasn't exactly thinking straight for the next few months after the accident. Had my mom not driven me to my new college and dumped me on the sidewalk, I probably wouldn't have gone at all. It's only a 30 minute drive from my house. Five months after the accident, Axel still didn't show any signs of waking up and nobody knew why. As I said above, I'm not a computer person. After the accident, I didn't really touch my crappy 2011 Chromebook unless I had to type up a paper or something. My Skype account and Facebook were basically untouched until like, I shit you not this year. If someone had to communicate with me, it was either through phone or my Yahoo account. And even then, I checked my email on average twice a week. That's probably the only reason why I clicked on that email. Now that I look back, I should have immediately moved it to my spam box. But because of my stupid human curiosity, I didn't. The email itself was not special or extravagant enough for me to post here. The only thing in the message box was a link. The sender was some sort of no reply sort of thing, and I thought the link would just send me to some sort of other site that I hadn't heard of yet. Instead, it just sent me to some sort of chat room. You know Cleverbot? It was basically that, only without the logo. I remember explicitly moving my mouse over to the X on the tab when a line of text appeared. Do you want to save your best friend? That scared me. I hadn't really discussed Axel's accident with anyone, not even my family. The people who really did know the situation, the people who really did know the situation knew that Axel probably never was going to wake up. The only conclusion I could really come up with was that it was some asshole from my high school that decided it would be funny to play the sick joke on me. So, with my grand typing speed of 45 words per minute, I told the guy to fuck off. I was surprised when I got a response almost immediately. I can help you. I shouldn't have kept going, but I was tired and already pissed off at my English professor, so I did. If I remember correctly, it was something about how making fun of a person induced in a coma was a really shitty way to pass time. Once again, I got another response which completely ignored my obvious lack of enthusiasm. I can bring him back. Because I didn't have anything else better to do, I asked him what he wished to bring back. I wish I didn't. Alex's soul. Just putting it out there, I'm not a religious person. Though I wasn't a hardcore atheist, I didn't really believe in things like souls and other crap like that. Unfortunately, the chat, however, had me intrigued. Whoever was behind this knew Axel's name and that I was his best friend. What an elaborate prank I thought back then, as I promptly told the other guy to stop spamming me. Why do you think Axel's not waking up? That was the line that really got me, and one of the reasons why I can still remember this chat verbatim two years later. I stood up so fast that my chair was knocked over. The pain of Axel trapped in that coma was still ever present, and despite all my beliefs, I started to wonder in the back of my head, what if Axel wasn't waking up because his soul wasn't there? His body was perfectly fine, at least medically, so it would make sense that he wasn't awake because he was missing something else, something like a soul. Almost as if the person behind the screen could see me, another line of text appeared without me replying. I can save him, but I need your help. Not suspicious at all, right? I wish someone was there back in my dorm to tell me to my face back two years ago. But back then, all I could think was, what if he was telling the truth? What if this wasn't some prank and this guy really could save Alex? I was desperate and five months of pent up emotions weren't really helping either. I remember asking the person behind the screen specifically, this isn't a prank, right? No, I will bring back all of him. I just need your help. And then I typed, all of Axel? All of Axel's soul? I wish I paid more attention to that thing's reply. I will bring back all Axel's. What did I have to lose? 
Now I realize I had so much to lose, but of course, now it's too late. What did you need me to do? I need your approval. That should have been the gateway, but it didn't click in my stupid clouded mind. The possibility of saving Alex, I was willing to take it. If it was something as simple as my approval, who wouldn't do that for their best friend? Who wouldn't want to save their best friend? The word okay barely left my lips when the line of text appeared once again on that white text box. Your contract has been approved. I didn't even stop to wonder how the person knew I said okay when I didn't even type my reply. All I could do was jump when I heard my phone ring. I recognized the number immediately. It was the hospital Axel was staying in. I will never forget the receptionist's voice over the phone as she explained to me how Axel woke up, how he woke up screaming and clawing his throat, how by the time I arrived at the hospital and looked into his eyes, I didn't see Axel anymore, how he never stopped screaming, even when the doctors gagged him to prevent him from biting his tongue off, how every time I saw him from then on, I saw a completely different person looking at me through his eyes. I thought that Axel's had been a typo. Only when I saw that text on my phone did I really realize how wrong I had been. See, I brought all of them, just like I promised. To this day, I'm still not sure what I did. I screamed at my phone for a reply. Hell, I even drove all the way back to my dorm and screamed at my laptop. I never got a reply, and Axel never recovered. He was awake, but it wasn't him. Eventually, they had to move him to an insane asylum because they couldn't get him to stop screaming. From what I hear, they had to cuff his hands and feet with some sort of padding to prevent himself from scratching his throat out. I only visited him once, and that was a year and a half ago. I still can't get rid of his screams from my nightmares. And now, here I am, two years later in a completely different dorm with a less shitty computer and a somewhat better mental state typing to you guys because I'm scared. I just got a call from the asylum. Axel wants to talk to me, but I'm not sure if it's even him anymore. Number 4. I want to start this story off by saying I am a 22 year old guy living in a small town in upstate New York. My name is Kevin. I won't use my last name for obvious reasons. My father, Steve, was a doctor and a brilliant man. He also died to save my life. Just a little over a year ago, I was desperately broke, not a penny to my name. You see, although my father had money, he really had more of the, just cause I'm rich doesn't mean my kids are rich kind of attitude. Sure, he'd buy me food and give me a place to live, but he never bought me a car or paid for anything that wasn't necessary, like going to a concert with friends or something. But he did do one thing, and that was find me a job. I was 100% against it when he first told me about it. Being one of the biggest doctors in our area, he had tons of connections to the community, especially in his field, so his grand idea was to have me work at a psych ward. Father of the year. Well anyway, like I said, I was 100% against it. What are you, crazy? I think were my first words in my response. 25 bucks an hour was his response. That was enough for me to break, especially when my bank account balance was looking like a string of Cheerios. Before I said yes to him, however, I needed to know what I had to do. He told me I would basically be a janitor to which I scrunched my face at, but that 25 an hour was too tempting. How the hell did you get me that wage? Do you know the guy or something? Sure do, he said. Bob Conti. I already talked to him on the phone yesterday. You walk down there tomorrow and tell him that Guinea, your pop, says, lay off the gold chains. I was never going to say that to him. The next day I rode my bike the six mile journey to Williams Asylum. The bleak white painted building had no life to it. It gave a crawling feeling to my skin. The front doors creaked when I opened them. The peeling paint crinkling under my fingers. I was immediately greeted by a 30 to 35 year old woman sitting in a small lounge area. Hello, she said in a bubbly tone. How can I help you? She said smiling. Um, hi, my name is Kevin. Um, hi, I'm Kevin, I said uneasily. Yeah, so I think I'm supposed to meet with Bob? Bob Conti? Oh yes, she said. Bob is in his office right now. If you follow me, I can bring you to him. Okay, I said as she was standing from her desk. She walked in a calm fashion, her high heels echoing off the corridor halls, clacking on every step her brown hair bouncing along with her rhythm, a little overdressed for the job I thought. Bob, she called out down the hall to the approaching door. 
Bob, you have a visitor. She paused. What's your name again? She asked nicely. Kevin, I said. Kevin is here to see you, she said through the door. I'm Tammy, by the way, she said in a quieter tone to me. The door opened moments later with a tall man standing on the other side. Hello there, Kevin, he said in a tired voice. How can I help you? Yeah, my father talked to you on the phone about starting work here. He told me to talk to you. I said, unsure of the actions to take next. Oh, right, right. Well, first off, I should start by showing you around the place, he said, leaving his office. Your main job will be feeding the patients and washing the bathrooms and generally just keeping things clean around here. Feeding them, I questioned, uneasy of the task. Well, really, all you have to do is put a lunch tray through the feeding slot in their cells. It's not like you're spoon feeding them, he explained. I gave a sigh of relief. His way of speaking of the patients gave me chills. He referred to them almost as animals. Conti, is that Northern Italian? I asked, trying to get to know him a bit. What's that? He said with a twist on his face. Conti, that's Italian, right? I asked again. Oh, Conti, I thought you said Monty, he said jokingly. Yeah, Northern Italian, good guess. I laughed and asked him to tell me a bit more about the job. There are only 10 patients here, one of which is in 24 hour solidarity. Not to tell you, but I must tell you, he is a murderer. He is clinically insane and not allowed in prisons, and under no circumstances are you to ever talk to him. He is very manipulative and violent. Please, for your own safety, if you ever have a concern or question about him, come to myself or Tammy, he said, he said with a serious look in his eyes. I could instantly feel the direness of his words. I understand, I said with a gulp. Okay, anyway, he said, right now the other nine patients are in their rooms and will get to come out a little later for their nightly hour of common room time. Believe it or not, most of them play board games, while a few play with the imaginary bunnies that walk around with them. It will take some time getting used to, but trust me, it's not as hard as it sounds. I guess I'm going to have to take your word on that one, I said. This is the common room, he said as we rounded the corner to a small room with a few tables and chairs strewn around it, a few different board games on the shelves. All you have to do is sit right there for about an hour and make sure no one kills anybody. My jaw dropped, unable to say anything. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. The other nine inmates are all non-violent. They have zero records of physical altercations. They've got some foul mouths though, so be ready for that, he reassured. He showed me the bathrooms and the holding cells and the rest of the grounds until finally the tour was over and we were back at his office. So most of the time I'm in my office, doing the paperwork for invoices and making sure I've made the orders for food shipments and whatnot. You know, ownership stuff. Anyway, you can always talk to Tammy if you need anything. She's usually at her desk. Think of her as your sub boss. Welcome aboard, he said with an extending handshake. What, what do I do now? I said in an unsure voice. Talk to Tammy. She will run you through the specifics. He said as he slowly closed the door. I walked down the winding, confusing hallways, finally making my way to Tammy's desk. So, I said. So, this is more than half the job, she said with her arms extended to the side, sitting on your ass and waiting for the day to end. Wait, really? I asked skeptically. Yup, she said. You're looking at it. So, what am I supposed to do? I still asked. You know what? I can let the patients out early tonight so you can see how that works, she explained. Bob shouldn't mind. I agreed since I really had no other choice. We walked back down the maze of corridors to the long, narrow stretch of hallway extending from the common room. The long hall had five doors on each side, all identical, solid and white with a tint of yellow from the aging. Each had a small slot in the door which led to a tray-like feature on the other side. The decaying tiles on the wall had faded colors of a pale brown. Tammy walked in front of me, jingling the keys in her hands while opening the first door on the right. Here's old Jackson, she said as the door creaked open. A shadowy-eyed man with gray hair slowly rose to his feet, his back hunched and purple bags sagging from the hollow sockets dug into his skull. He seemed to hardly have the energy to saunter by me, with an indifference to my existence. I was overwhelmed with feelings when I saw my first patient. The next few doors were the same story. 
Shells of human beings walking down the narrow hallway, dead-eyed and distant. Zombies. On the sixth door, finally, there was a change. An older black man with an obvious scar running its length down the side of his head. He had short hair and one whitened eye. His appearance shocked me at first, but later intrigued me. I was desperate to know what happened to him. What's up, man? I see you looking at me, dog. The man spoke in a quick manner, his words spitting from his mouth. He stood to his feet and walked by both Tammy and myself, still bantering about his stories. I had six tigers, four lions, 17 mountain lions. You know, the ones from the mountains, not the ones from Africa. Homeland. Shit, man, lions and tigers and bears. Tammy interrupted him. I assumed she was sick of his ramblings, as was I. That's Rick. He probably won't answer to that, though, she said. Damn straight I won't answer to that. Scar's the name, he said with a twisting face. Tammy rolled her eyes. Moving on, she said. Cell 7 and Cell 8 had two older women who seemed to be very twitchy, flinching and ducking at things that weren't there, and eventually sprinting down the hall. Anne and Kate, she called them. Cell 9 had a young woman with fiery eyes. She had a tight muzzle strapped around her face, muffling her screams. Her eyes pierced straight through me with terror. Tammy had to practically drag her from her cell. Oh, come on, Renee. He's not going to hurt you. Tammy kept reassuring her. The woman was desperately trying to scream words to myself and Tammy. She finally broke free from Tammy's grasp and mechanically sprinted down the hall. Tammy was swift after her, tackling her to the floor and crashing into the common room. The other patients watched in surprise. Tammy forcibly ripped the frightened patient to her feet, walking her back down the hall. She shoved her into the cell and slammed the door shut. You can stay in there until you learn how to act in the common room. She screamed with fury to Renee. She slammed her hand four times on the door in clear anger. I had no idea what to do. I was frozen. I gulped as I watched the scene unfold. Tammy finally removed her attention from Renee, the disgruntled patient. Ugh. She sighed out. I'm sorry, she mumbled. I, I, I don't think I can do this. I said as I slowly turned my back to her and began to leave the building. No, you can't leave, she said. We desperately need the extra help around here, as you can see. Her voice still trembling with stress. I now hear the haunting screams of a deeper voice. The man in cell 10, also muffled by what I assume was a muzzle. I took a deep breath, followed by a long stretch of silence. Come on, I can show you the games we play with some of the patients, she said with longing. Okay, I finally broke. It may have had something to do with her attractiveness. Her face was the definition of perfect, and her body wasn't far behind. She smiled wide with my acceptance to the rest of the job. We made our way to the common room where the patients had still been dazzled by what they had seen. Who wants to play house? Tammy broke the silence with her question. Surprisingly, Jackson, Scar, Anne, and Kate all happily volunteered to join in on the game. The old man, Jackson, feebly rose his hand as if too afraid to ask a question. Yes, Jackson? Tammy questioned. Her voice held a tone that an adult would use with a toddler. Can, can I be the baby? His raspy voice seeped out. Well, of course you can, Jackson. You've already got your diapers on, she laughed. Jackson had a dopey-eyed smile on as he pulled his pants down to show us his shit-stained diapers. I instantly retracted on impulse. I gagged as the smell hit my nose. I almost puked all over him. Kevin, Tammy shouted. You can't act like that around the patients. Oh look, now he's crying. The skinny man sobbed uncontrollably and finally ran to the other corner of the room to sulk. Tammy left in a huff after the man, picking up a spare diaper on the way. Did baby Jackson make a poopy? She said with a smile. He giggled and lifted his legs into the air. She stripped him and proceeded to change his diaper in the middle of the room. Once again, I was frozen in disbelief. I wanted to say something, but I couldn't. This couldn't be legal. I was disgusted to the point of nausea. Meanwhile, Scar was lying on his back panting like a dog and kicking his legs in the air. I'm the pooch, yo. He laughed hysterically. Bark, bark. Tammy popped her head up from her disgusting duty. Yes, you are, Rick. You're a good boy. I'm Scar, he screamed. Roof, roof, aroo. Jackson clapped his hands when Tammy was done changing his diaper. 
she slipped his pants back on and stood him to his feet. She quickly ran over to Scar and started rubbing his belly. He slabbed his tongue out and rolled from side to side. Rough, rough. Kate perked her eyes and exclaimed that she wanted to be the wife. Wife, Tammy questioned. To me, that would make you a lesbian. You're not a lesbian, are you, Kate? No, Kate yelled. I'm his wife, she said, pointing to me. I didn't know what to do. I didn't know what to do. I looked at Tammy for guidance. She raised her eyebrows at me as if I should play along. Kate started walking towards me, a wide smile on her face. I stepped back a few feet and she finally reached me. Her arms coiled around me tightly and squeezed. My hands shook as she squeezed even harder. I glared at Tammy, waiting for her to do something about it. She's just playing, Kevin, Tammy said with no concern. Are you sure? I hardly managed to squeeze out. Finally, Kate loosened her grasp and stood back. I took a breath in the momentary calmness. Her hands struck back up and clenched my face. She pulled my face towards hers. I twisted my body from her and shoved her away. Tammy quickly intervened and reprimanded Kate. I stormed out of the room, unable to process what was going on. I ended up sitting down in the front lobby, breathing heavily and staring out the front door. Looking back, I have no idea why I didn't walk out at that moment and just be done with it. Something told me to stay. I could distinctly hear Tammy's screams to the patients, sending them all back to their rooms, clearly angry with Kate's behavior. Finally, she came to the lobby, a fluster in her breath. I said the first words before she could say anything. This is messed up, I said. I seriously cannot do this shit. Listen, Kevin, they are excited to see someone new in here and are just acting erratically. They are almost always calm and controllable, she tried to explain. No, everything is messed up, I said. You're playing house with a bunch of loonies and one of them wants to have sex with me. I defended my right of being upset. You really should not refer to the patients like that, she said flatly. There was a long stretch of silence in the small lobby. I think you should go home for the night and think about it, she said, but I urge you to give it another shot tomorrow. I said nothing as I walked out the doors. The first thing I did when I got home was tell my dad about the events. I explained to him that I just couldn't do it. He insisted that I go back. Come on, Kevin, don't make me look bad. Bob told me over and over again how they were struggling to find good workers around there. And here the man offers you 25 bucks an hour and you just say you can't do it? Just please, for your father, go back tomorrow. I couldn't say no to the man. Noon, the next day, right back at it. Tammy was glad I was back. She even cooked me lunch. A few thinly cut pieces of venison between two thick slices of white bread. It was worth it just coming back for that sandwich. Damn, that was amazing, I said. I haven't had venison since I was like six. I forgot how good it tasted. Thanks, she said with a half laughing smile. The next few hours, Tammy and I just sat, talking, waiting for the common room time. Talking about mindless stuff. Finally, she decided it was time to let the patients out. We walked down the winding hallways to the common room. She told me to wait there while she released all the patients. She was back shortly after, a flood of wackos behind her. Some of the quieter ones began playing checkers with each other, while the other livelier group came to Tammy and myself. Have I ever told you I used to have eight kimono dragons? Scar chimed in. Names were Charlie, Bruce, Lil Terry, Big Terry, Sebastian. Okay, who's ready to play house? Tammy asked, cutting Scar off. They all jumped for excitement when she suggested it. It just creeped me out. Their facial expression chilled me. I just needed to leave the room. Where's the bathroom, Tammy? Just down the hall past the cell rooms, she told me. I quickly left the room, jetting past the cell hallway, hearing the haunting muffled screams of the man in cell 10. Chills ran through my whole body. I finally made it to the bathroom. I didn't even have to go. I just sat on the toilet for about 10 minutes until I could gather my thoughts. I walked back down the hall slowly, not even really wanting to get back to the common room. The man had seemed to have stopped screaming. I got closer to the hall and my spine tingled. Before long, I was standing at the end of the long dead hallway, directly in front of cell 10. I was strangely curious, with the same longing feeling to look down when you're standing atop a towering ledge. I was staring at the pale white door. There was no sound whatsoever, 
No movement, no breathing, no screaming, nothing. I crouched down, slowly moving my face to the feeding slot, peeking through with my eyes. I could barely see anything, mostly shadows and an obstructed view from the feeding tray. I knelt down to try to get a better glance. As I repositioned myself, I noticed something on the floor just by the door frame, a small puddle of deep red blood pooling a few inches out from the door. I lost my breath. As I looked back up through the slot, I was staring at two bloodshed eyes split open in terror. I fell to my back, fear engulfing my body. My head slammed on the door of cell 9, directly across the hall from cell 10. I had forgot there was a patient in cell 9, that is, until she started screaming again. The man in cell 10 started slamming what I assumed was his face or hands against the door. I quickly scrambled to my feet and started making my way back to the common room to tell Tammy the patient was bleeding. At the end of the hall stood Kate. Her eyes pierced me. Hello, husband, she said coldly. She started walking towards me with haste. I didn't even hesitate to burst by her. I slammed her body against the wall and ran the narrow hallways to the common room. Tammy was sitting on the couch with her back to me while the patients wandered, free to do whatever they like. Are you even paying attention? I screamed at her. You've got crazy people all over the place and you're just sitting in here. My words were cut off from the shock of what I was seeing as I walked to the front side of the couch. Jackson laid on his side, his head over his lap, while he sucked on her exposed nipple. What the hell is going on in here? I screamed in disbelief. Tammy quickly jumped up, putting her breast back in her shirt. Feed the baby, feed the baby, Jackson happily exclaimed. He's just playing, Tammy pleaded. I shook my head in disgust. I'm going to tell Bob. No, you can't, she screamed as she followed after me. I made it to Bob's office much quicker than she had, opening the door unannounced. He was sitting at his desk, the barrel of a pistol in his mouth. He looked at me with surprise and pulled it out of his mouth quickly. I was in shock. He quickly turned to anger. Never interrupt me during my private time. His voice shaking in rage. His face turned red with fury as he stood from his desk. The photo of his medical license hung in contrast on the wall behind him. His calm smiling face on the document seemed to mock him from behind. I looked at the photo with more focus. Dread seeped into my soul, for I came to realize the man in the photo on the wall and the man behind the desk were not the same people. My heart sank. At first I had no idea what to do. I backed out of the office slowly until I came into contact with Tammy. She was hysterical and screaming that I not tell Bob. The intense skittishness of myself at the time caused me to backhand her with reactive fear. She fell to the ground instantly, the keys to the cell sliding across the hall. My gut wrenched as the gears in my head started turning, piecing together what I thought was happening. I snatched the keys and sprinted down the twisting halls dodging the wandering dead-eyed patients. I went straight to cell number 10 and twisted the key in the door. My suspicions were confirmed when I saw the man, the same man from the photo in the office, Bob Conti. My stomach twisted and I nearly threw up when I realized what I had eaten earlier that day. He had multiple hunks of meat removed from his thigh, blood running down his legs and pooling on the ground. Before I could even react, I glanced down the long tight hallway to see Tammy, standing still with a petrifying twist in her eyes, a knife with dried blood dangling from her right hand. Her head tilted and a soul-killing smile crept across her face. I stepped away, my back hitting the dead end wall. She moved with an inhuman speed towards me, the knife raised with intent. She hissed at me with a loudness of a frightened cat. I stumbled over my own feet and fell into the cell. She slammed the door shut and made chilling cackles of laughter. Did someone get scared? She giggled through the feeding slot. She jabbed the knife through the hole repeatedly, boisterously laughing with insanity. She finally walked away, leaving us locked in the room. I had the keys, but they served no purpose from inside the cell. I removed Bob's muzzle and he explained to me what had happened, and that the woman in cell 9, Renee, was the receptionist. There was nothing we could do. I spent the next 18 hours in that godforsaken cell, waiting for my death. I'm sure most of you are wondering about my father, and why I started this story off explaining that he died to save my life. When I didn't come home that night, he must have been extremely worried. 
He wanted to speak with Bob in person to see if he had heard from me or knew where I may have gone. The man who had impersonated Bob shot and killed my father, but not before he called the police to let them know something was wrong. The man behind the desk died in a shootout with the police, and they had to use a blowtorch to open the doors to both cell 10 and cell 9. Renee was somewhat back to normal within the first year, but Bob never recovered. I don't think I have either. The police say there was never a woman in the building or around the area that matched the description of Tammy. It's been a year now. The reason I'm telling this story today is because last night, I saw Tammy. There's no mistaking it. Her face has been burned into my mind. She was standing in front of my house, just staring with cold eyes. I have no idea how she could have found me, no explanation whatsoever. I'm in serious fear for my life. I've already contacted the police and they will be keeping an eye on my house day and night. I cannot live my life with this perpetual fear. Number 5. You see, Majori and I are twins. Growing up we did everything together. We wore the same outfits, had our hair done in the same braids, and we played with the same toys. We shared everything except our personalities. I was always much more social and extroverted than Majori. Outshining her in school and other activities, she was quiet and often sank into the background while I performed and excelled, but it was undeniable that we cared about each other. I'm not sure you'll ever really know when someone you love is crazy, but with Majori, I can remember a distinct point at age 7 when I began to think something was unusual. We'd been going to bed and I was unable to find my favorite Cabbage Patch doll, which I had been sleeping with for years. When I finally saw her sun yellow hair under the toy chest, I grabbed her out excitedly, but screamed and recoiled when I saw that she had been shredded and dismembered, with deep scratches all across her eyes and mouth. I told my parents what Majori had done and they chuckled in disbelief. That night, Majori whispered to me, it will be our little secret. By the time we finished high school, not much had changed. If anything, we had grown even more dramatically different. I had been popular, invited by many boys to prom, and Majori had been distant, eating lunch alone and refusing to participate in anything. My parents didn't seem to care either way. They were there for us in whatever capacity we wanted to be. Majori simply didn't seem to want anything. We went to the same university and shared a dorm room. My freshman year was a blur of parties and drinking coupled with late night cram sessions. Majori said she was doing fine and enjoying herself, but sometimes I felt as if she was a bystander in her own life, doing very little and just watching. It was also my freshman year that I was raped. I had awoken from a weekend night and immediately knew something was wrong. I couldn't remember anything, except I was in incredible pain and saw blood stains all across my clothes. When I looked up, Majori was tenderly smoothing my hair saying, it will be our little secret. That morning, they found the fraternity guy I had last remembered being with. He was stuffed in a dumpster, ripped apart limb by limb with his eyes and mouth gouged by a deep pocket knife. My parents called me once the news of the murder spread, but I assured them we were fine. At 23, when I had gotten my first job, Majori had been living with me and working from home. On a day when I grabbed lunch with her, she saw why it had been so easy for me to get the job I had. My boss was a lurcherous creep and had been coming on to me for weeks since the hire. I didn't enjoy it, but I didn't want to ruin my budding career. That night, after another exhausting day of work, I could have sworn I heard Majori say through the bedroom wall, it will be our little secret. The next morning, my boss was found under his desk in pieces, with his eyes and lips ripped apart. You need to understand, I was protecting her. I've always loved my sister. Last month, I was mugged on my way home. I had taken a shortcut late at night and was attacked by two thugs. When I came staggering home bruised and beaten and torn clothes, I knew what Majori would say before she even did. It will be our little secret. That night, she hadn't been as careful as before. The cops were called and when morning broke and two dead bodies laid strewn across our front lawn in pieces, eyes and mouths covered in hundreds of deep scratches. So now, we're visiting her. I think they're trying to keep us safe from Majori because they've kept me in a white padded room for a while now. I spoke to my parents about an hour ago. They keep telling me Majori was a stillborn. They must be truly distraught and I hate having to look them in the eyes and say, this isn't the time for jokes. Before you go, I wanted to tell you about the giveaway I'm hosting. 
But first off, thanks for watching and leave a like so I know you made it to the end of the video. Don't forget to subscribe because I upload new videos every week. My name is Chills and I'm thanking you all for your support by giving away three $100 Amazon.com gift cards. It's completely free to enter and you can enter the giveaway by visiting the link at the very bottom of the description. It doesn't matter when you're watching this video because top15s.net slash giveaway will automatically direct you to my most recent giveaway. See the terms and conditions on the linked page for full details. If you want to follow me on social media, my Twitter is at YT underscore chills and my Instagram is at Dylan is chillin' YT with underscores instead of spaces. Feel free to send me a DM if you have any questions or suggestions. See ya.